Thank you so much. I hope you can hear me. Great. So there are two things that I want to mention briefly or to get off my chest before I start. What John mentioned briefly before the break, the simple fact that this Mansein conference can live only because some uh, a bunch of uh, men are fully dedicated uh, to this. I know it from my everyday practice as an andrologist. So men's medicine, these conferences uh, are exactly the one thing that men need. Uh, I would love to prescribe this uh, to many of my patients because this is of the essence. I could prescribe it as a medical uh, prescription. That's why I wish from the bottom of my heart that John and his team get enough motivational force that we hand it back to them, this uh, feedback, this encouragement. Try to spread the voice. The second point that is also close to my heart, and I just noticed when I stepped up for the first time during the last presentation that I delivered the, uh, the, about men's issues. It was sexual disorders of the men, about 75 uh, listeners, but only women, <laughs> only women <laughs> for me. Well, I had uh, to reach out. Uh, well, I uh, abused my co-moderator as an alibi. And um, finally, I uttered the words, ladies and gentlemen. Well, uh, this uh, speaks uh, volumes, uh, male sexuality, disorders of male sexuality. On the other hand, uh, it seems to be as important as to prompt uh, the secondary uh, victims, uh, i.e. the ladies, to uh, encourage uh, their husbands and parents. Good, uh, good morning, gentlemen. It's good for me to, to speak to gentlemen, not only to ladies. So the topic today. Well, I selected uh, men's uh, health uh, in the 21st century, an integrative remit for the man. It's a very cumbersome title, but it still matters to me because you find two main messages in this. Uh, men's health go well beyond, goes well beyond the pure physical aspects. The second aspect is it's about a remit to the man. We cannot delegate this to our female partners. We men must take on the responsibility. This is my agenda. We are going to talk a few minutes about somatic medicine, which is important, but two things that go well beyond uh, the close silo of our usual thinking. Somatic medicine, physical medicine, well, the preventive model is of the essence. We need to take this to our heart. This is a statistical overview. The most frequent death courses in 2020 with regards to men, COVID, we do have COVID and some other things uh, that are somehow um, um, spoiling the effect. We had about uh, 200,000 uh, death cases, about 100, half of them due to cardiac and lung cancer, and 52,000 cancer conditions. 15,000 are d related to dementia. What is important? Uh, these two major death causes, cardiac arrests and cancer diseases, are at least avoidable in a in the sense that they must not come as a destiny. They are not. Uh, they, uh, they can be prevented. They are preventable, so as to avoid it. So and uh, well. Women are leading the way. We men uh, do not attend the preventive appointments. Uh, if I had this uh, the talk delivered uh, 10 years ago, only 20% of the men would go. Today, it's only 40% of males uh, that go to the preventive medical checkups. What do you have to do when so as to avoid those uh, 
major death causes. It's about lifestyle and prevention. I do not want to carry coal to New Newcastle. Everybody knows about how to prevent through avoiding alcohol, but there are some major things uh, that let me wrap them up. Every man needs a good family doctor or a GP, general practitioner, who can check up the cardiac and the circulatory. Is there any trend towards diabetes? What about uh, the blood pressure? Life habits are also checked. We also need well, skin cancer prevention. You know, I come from a generation um, where my parents didn't really care about sun protection. I don't blame it on my parents, but as kids, we were just running around naked without any skin protection. But there is, well, what is called a, a dermatological memory. In other words, the skin doesn't forget that. And this can cause skin cancer unless you detect it early enough. The same applies to urological um, screens. Well, that should start at an age of 45. And there's also um, colon cancer screening um, for patients who are 50 and over. The health insurance has said we should reduce the, um, the thresh threshold age from 55 to 50 years. We should start screening for colon cancer a bit earlier because it's much more expensive for us as health insurances to well pay for the treatments than for the screening. Now between 20 and 40 years of age, the most frequent form of cancer we can develop is testicle cancer. Now testicle cancer is something you don't feel in the beginning. You don't feel pain in the testicles. You don't feel fatigue or tired. It's just that the testicles change their consistency. Um, now, you know, um, there was a time when you were obliged to jo join the German army as a young man. And of course, they did a medical test. And one thing was they really grabbed you like this between the legs. That was part of the tests in order to see if you're healthy and can join the army. Now, that was not a very nice experience. But what they did was they wanted to see if you have testicle cancer. Now, there's no obligation to join the army anymore for young men. And that's why you don't have these medical tests anymore. And that's why. Um, there are more undete undetected cases of uh, testicle cancer. Now, testicle cancer can be cured in 97% per of all cases, but it has to be discovered early. And that's why I can only advise everyone in that age to go to a urologist to check the balls. And then um, the urologist can see if you have cancer. And um, in a way, you will know then that this is how healthy testicles feel. And then you know what it should feel like. And later on, when you discover that there's something hard, some kind of nod in your testicles when you touch them, then you know that you have to go to a urologist again in order to check if it's cancer. So that's the first mission. Check your body. Make sure you go to scans and also have a look at your lifestyle. Now it's getting a bit more complex. The question that I really deal with um, based on my daily practical experience, because um, I regularly see men who uh, don't seem to have any physical disease, any somatic or bodily disease, but they feel ill. They feel pain, they are tired, they feel fatigue, as it is called. Um, now, when you want to cope with that kind of problem, the first thing you should think about is the topic of stress. I mean, this guy here, that's Usain Bolt, he has a lot of stress. I, I suppose you all know him, um, the fastest man in the world. Now, in this moment, you know, at the start of a race, of course, he's completely off this planet. He's completely focused just on the thing that he is doing in that moment. And in his brain, there are certain neurobiologic processes going on like, well, the release of stress mediators. Um, glucose will be pumped into the brain to make sure the brain has a lot of energy available on a short-term basis. And all of that happens in order to make sure that this man can achieve a great performance in a very short period of time. Now, that's something that we know from archaic models, like the reflex to escape, to run away. For example, our ancestors, when they were chasing animals and there was a big animal attacking them, then they ran away. It was an impulse, a reflex. And it's the same here. It's a neurobiologic uh, reaction that we all immediately make. 
And well, then we have to let off steam, of course, like he does. You know, he really drums his feet into the ground with all the strength that he has and um, runs to the finish line. And at the end of the race, after just about 10 seconds, he has arrived. And as we can see very well here in his face, there's a relief of tension. The tension is reduced afterwards. He can relax again and the neurobiological system can get back to normal. But what happens when this shot that he has to hear so that he can really start running, when this shot doesn't come, when there is no starting shot? Well, here again, there's a lot of scientific research um, because what will happen in such a case if there's a permanent stress without any relief, there will be a different process, the glucose level will be reduced, which means the performance will reduce, the serotonin level or serotonin concentration declines. And if you know somebody who has or has had uh, depression, then you will know that serotonin is the relevant neurotransmitter that can prevent depressions. And when the serotonin concentration sinks, exactly the opposite can happen. And then there's a permanent increase in dopamine. Now, dopamine uh, is a substance that has an activating impact on the cardiovascular system. So what happens is we um, have this impulse, this um, reflex to escape in such a moment, this inner restlessness. You know, it's just a slight restlessness. We never have this moment like we had this morning when we inhaled and then exhaled again. But this doesn't happen. In this case, you have this permanent stress going on. It's like a little flame that's burning all the time. Um, you're always under pressure. There's always a certain tension. Um, and in psychology, we call this a negative stimulation experience. Now, this permanent stress without any stress relief has well, a proven impact on our health because it will lead to increased blood pressure, depression, burnout. There are various uh, psychosomatic uh, diseases that can be caused, like neurodermitis, um, hyperactive bladder. Typically, um, this can be seen in patients who have well, a loss of libido. They are not, no longer interested in uh, sexual activity. Or premature ejaculation is also a symptom of such a um, neurobiologic um, cascade that is disturbed. And at the end of this cascade, at the end of these neurobiologic problems, there's a premature ejaculation. And of course, there's also, well, an economic financial damage because these men are uh, ill, they are often absent from work. And as you can see at the bottom of the slide, this is not rare. 60% of the first contacts of men going to a GP is because they have psychosomatic problems. They don't really have any organic correlate, anything that you can cut out to make the man healthy again, or any pill you can prescribe to make the man Ill healthy again. 60% of the patients who go to a GP for the first time do so because they have a psychosomatic problem. And this also applies to my patients that I see. So let's take a step back and ask ourselves, where does this come from? Why are we so susceptible to permanent stress? Where does this come from? So let's have a look at, well, the um, development and structuring of our personality. Uh, the structure of our character, of our personality, and our ability to react to stress is, well, formed during the first few years of our lives. It starts with our birth, when we get out of our mother's womb, and connect to our mother's breast, there's a massive release of oxytocins, that's uh, hormones that make you feel happy. Uh, that's in the mother's brain. But it, we also get these um, substances, these hormones, because we drink them with our mother's milk. So um, the first time we suck on our mother's breast, we get, well, a high dose of these hormones. And it's the same kind of hormone that is released when we um, hug somebody or we embrace somebody. This hormone, oxytocin, is um, released. And what we do with that is, subconsciously, we save this. We keep this in mind as the main goal in our lives. We always want to have this oxytocin flash. We always want to have this feeling to be happy, to be loved. So that's something that happens over the first, or that becomes manifest and consolidated over the first three years of our lives. And then we start to learn 
and interact. And that's the second important part in this early development of our personalities. Because during that time, we still do things for the first time. We build a little tower, it collapses. Nobody helps us, so we have to build a bigger tower again. And we see that we are able to do something, to achieve something, to do something new. We take our first steps. When we fall, there's somebody there who puts us back on our feet again, and then we can go on walking. And the well, area in which we move becomes wider and bigger. And this feeling to explore something new is a very positive feeling. So we develop a positive connotation. When we think of developing or discovering and exploring something new, we get a positive feeling. And then um, we sooner or later detach from, from uh, the people that we are connected to. Um, and if things work well, then later on, sooner or later, we will get back um, from, well, or to the kind of relationship that we want to lead, and we will be autonomously able to, well, form relationships with other people. And, well, here we have uh, an image taken by an uh, electron microscope that shows you the density of synapses. And in this age group, you can see that um, we are really able to learn and to absorb things. So the things that we experience during these first few years are so important for the development of our personality. And Gerald Hüter, who will be with us tomorrow, um, wrote in one of his many, wrote about this in many of his interesting books. And he uh, said that at the end of the day, you can say what this boils down to is, as men, we want the feeling of love, and safety, and what we want is a task that we can use in order to grow. And that's something that we do not only, well, develop in our society, but it is something that really happens on a neurobiologic level. So because of the way we are, the, because of the way we function neurobiologically, we are primed this way. We have to fulfill these ba basic needs. Now, the problem is, even though we can well trace this back over the past 200 years genetically, our environment has changed drastically and it keeps changing um, faster and faster. The German Ministry of Family, Elderly Citizens, Women and Youth um, carried out uh, an opinion poll in 2020. And the question was, what is typical of men? What is typical of masculinity? masculinity? Now, 57% of all men replied by saying that they want to take care of their children and be a loving father. About one out of three men said, I want to do work in the household. And just over 30% said, it's important to me to have a great career and earn a lot of money and be financially independent. Now, the women who participated in the survey said, 69% men should play a role when it comes to raising children. That's great, because men see it that same way as well. But almost 80% of all women said, in the ideal case, my man, my husband, should be able to financially take care of the family on his own. He should earn the money. So we have this problem, this discrepancy. On the one hand, we have the men who want to be close to their children on an emotional level, and the career isn't so important to them. But on the other hand, we have the woman who wants the all-in-one package. Um, the man should do everything. He should have a great career, and he should take care of the children as well. And that's the situation we are in. What should we do about it? How do I get the love that I want, and how do I find the tasks that I can use for myself in order to grow? Now, the problem is, and it's something that we can experience on a daily basis, something I can see in my daily work, men have these negative stimulation experiences because they cannot live, they cannot do um, what they want to do. And if they actually do that, if they are actually able to, well, to live their dream, um, then this will have a strong emotional impact on them. So what do we do with all of this? We're in a dilemma, obviously, but what we do is we react, although we only react on a subconscious level, and that's an important thing. Our brain absorbs all this stimulus coming from outside, but at the same time, we also have this kind of feeling. We feel that some things feel weird in our life, and well, when you 
what, what happens is our brain compares the experiences that we've had so far as kids when we felt good or not so good and compares it compares our childhood so to speak with our current situation and that's how the brain develops a reaction pattern in order to respond respond to a stressful situation so what psychologists call this is assimilation or adaption uh, reaction now what does this adaption look like one option is we uh, react in such a way that we try to develop a solution strategy in order to solve the problem. Now that is desirable. That would be the healthy, the good adaption reaction. And then there's the other alternative, which would be to withdraw. And there's another option, another scenario, and that would uh, be a disturbed adaption reaction. We develop an activity or we start an activity that doesn't lead us to our goal. Or we try to find, well, a way to identify ourselves with somebody or something uh, in a way that is not healthy. You see, yesterday in our small group, we talked about this during our get-together. We talked about different relationship patterns. Now, I borrowed this graph from Henry Cloud, um, a psychologist who works with couples in the US. He is so experienced in this field and has so interesting things to say. He says there's this classic behavior of men. Do I have a pointer here? No, I don't. But anyway, you can see it. Um, this is the thing we just talked about. The first one, Abhängigkeit at the top left, this means dependence. That's the wish for love, the wish for a ca caring partner, a good relationship. That's what we look for. By the way, this also happens on a professional level. We want to have a career. We want to, well, move up in the professional hierarchy and somehow try to get where we want to go. Now, if this gets too tough, too difficult, if we say this is too hard, now I need a break, then we move on to distraction. That's the um, top right square, Ablenkung, that means distraction. So you go out and watch a Champions League match or have a drink or you go to the gym and have very tough physical exercises there um, or you may spend a nice evening, have good sex or, um, or maybe we get a reward and that's the top left square, Belohnung, reward. For example, if we have been promoted at work, if we have achieved something, then we buy ourselves a nice watch to get a reward, to reward ourselves. And the problem is we have these three relationship patterns, these three blocks, these three squares we just saw, and that we use them in order to construct a new personality in order to get out of the dilemma I just described. In order to construct this personality, we um, have a look at, well, ideals and characters that we would like to be, even though they are not really us. Now, there's an interest, interesting research pro progress, uh, process that was carried out where they investigated what happens if a man tries to, well, follow an ideal to develop into an ideal figure to join a group of people he finds cool, but he doesn't really fit in because he is not like them. In that case, um, this can lead to alcohol consumption, to the misuse of substances, sexual overactivity with a high risk of getting a sexually transmitted infection because no condoms are used anymore, um, frequent change of sexual partners, and so on. So that's one thing that can happen. Or the other thing that can happen is the lone wolf. We, re we withdraw, like I said. And there's one thing I read that really made me sad. There's this handbook of man and masculinities. Um, it's created every two years, and in 2016, the author said that um, there's a six times higher suicide rate amongst w men than amongst women. Six times higher. What's the reason for that? Because women who fall into a depression, they look for help. Men who fall into a depression, they die as a lone wolf. And that is really moving. You know, the other day, there was a patient who came to me, a jurist, somebody who studied law. He has a much younger wife and a little child, and th then the wife left him. And the problem was, he was quite successful financially, and he reached this moment when he said, now I have enough money, so I can do something for myself now. In that moment, his wife leaves him and wants money from him, and he also wants to be there for the child. So he doesn't have a lot of time anymore for all of that. And what happens in that moment is, his partners at work say that his performance is too weak, that he didn't meet his um, contractual obligations, and that he's out of the law firm. So his partnership, his uh, was over as well. I mean, his wife had left him. He was thrown out of the law firm. And then in the end, he did commit suicide. So these are things that happen in our immediate 
neighborhood, in our immediate environment. And in the beginning, we don't even notice that because we try to do everything ourselves. We try to solve all the problems ourselves when they occur. The lone wolf tries to walk down his path on his own. He will always try to find some kind of solution strategy, like the partnership uh, scheme that we saw in one of the previous um, slides. And then just the annual report of the FBI that says that 80% of all murderers, of, of all murders, are committed by men. Again, an example that illustrates what happens when men develop extreme reactions. So with these reaction patterns, we have we are confronted with all the problems that we have because of the permanent stress, which is like CV pro cardiovascular problems, high blood pressure, but also a higher, higher, higher suicide rate than amongst women. So what can we do about it? And this leads us back to Henry Clark, our psychologist, who says it's very simple. Men, you need real encounters. You need authentic encounters. Well, what does it mean? The objective in any such relationship that we need to build up is to enter into resonance. Well, what matters to me? I'm a medical expert, a human medicine. I need evidence. Max Planck Institute for Neuronal Science has published a very important or interesting study. What do you need to enter into resonance? Those who were in resonance, well, they were checked medically through MRT. And uh, being in this situation of resonating, well, this is uh, linked uh, to well-being, to comfort, and well, what do we need? We need to talk about uh, fragility. We need to be able to present ourselves we as weak uh, pain points. Another important point, psychologically speaking, we need to reach a condition where we can to, can look at our own personal structure. We are looking from the top at our inner workings, but we cannot go it alone. Yesterday we reached this point. Anybody needs a psychotherapy? Well, this has been studied scientifically. The question is, does everybody need a th psychotherapy, and which one is the best uh, form? It's not about any type of therapy. The Hubble therapists, uh, this couple of therapists, is it, it's not a, whether it's a deep psychology or behavioral therapy or whatever, the important is a, re a relationship, Henry Cloud. Everything we need is a good friend, says Cloud. And we do have sound scientific evidence of, on the positive impact of relations. Uh, Ms. Holt Lundstedt, a psychiatrist in the U.S., together with their working group, uh, they have published uh, quite a number of studies. We know that any solid relationship can increase the life expectancy by 15 percent. We know for sure that somebody who does not have any social contacts will have a similar outcome of disease, similar to those who smoke 15 cigarettes, uh, inhaling deep into their lungs uh, per day. and. From when on will you be, you be a good friend? From when on will you be a good friend with somebody else? Well, uh, it's a very theoretical mindset. And, uh, uh, time frame was the only, and they stated, if, whenever you have been in close contact of, uh, with another person for two hundred hours, then you are a good friend. Well, I, I believe this. I have two buddies with who I meet one to one. We go one week sailing, uh, one week on a boat independently of the intensity for it's also very good for the for our contingent of hours so we come close to 200 hours i talked about reactive patterns when we t talk about relationship what do i make i need a good friend uh, but i have those patterns whenever stress comes up I lit a cigarette whenever I slide into stressful situations. I need to get out of the home, otherwise I can't stand it. And the magic word is neuroplasticity. 
We can change ourselves. We can change our character by certain learning patterns. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, we can alter or uh, generate from scratch neurobiological new structures. Not only can we redirect synapses, we can also create new synapses, new structures in our brain. So many processes are subconscious. It's uh, like a neurological motorway temperament. Uh, uh, we can move out of this motorway we can start uh, a bumpy ride uh, off the road, uh, but we can rewire, restructure our things. Well, I showed you some pictures uh, about the density of synap synapses in uh, children uh, six, year of, uh, six years old. Well, we could say, shit, we are too old now at any age. Uh, here we have made a full list of what is possible, what are good and bad influences. Even at a high age, uh, well, we can promote uh, the development of our brain. It's about new creation. Well, we can create uh, new synaptic structures. We also can generate new cellular structures. So the motivation that we get out of this. We can start any time. A quick Well, neuroplasticity means uh, we need uh, to create new structures. We need to unlearn old structures. Uh, one point uh, that is so important to me, we need motivation. The highest motivating force is to be fully loaded emotionally. Now, uh, a quite a simple example. Every no November, the men come up and, uh, well, it's about time I quit smoking. This is my last cigarette. Uh, then I see them back uh, end of February. Well, four weeks uh, they kept their promises. But those, and this is, uh, so to speak, uh, wired into their brain, they know it, not only bad conscience, uh, those who have uh, uh, lost a good friend to the lung cancer or who have received the diagnosis of lung cancer, they just quit it. No question, uh, they have an emotional overwhelming feeling. They have no problem at all to quit smoking right away. We need a strong emotional charge behind this wish to change, for example, in a relationship, if I know, I have aggressive trends, uh, I withdraw, for example, from my wife whenever she wants to speak to me, I, re I refrain, we don't have sex anyway, so I need to look at this. What is the emotional charge? What can we bring up from the bottom to the surface so that we can encompass the whole range of emotions so that I can take on my role as a man fully. And that can generate a motivation. This is yet another picture of rewiring of our synapses. How can we do this? In theory, it's super exciting. It sounds interesting. But what should I do? Her Herbert Benson and John Cabot Sin. These are certainly names familiar to many. These are the foundational fathers of the mind-body medicine uh, at attentive days where they move around. Every little step is taken with full awareness. Well, we have reached well beyond that point. Uh, for different uh, mind-body techniques, we have uh, sound scientific evidence. For example, we know that meditation can reduce stress. Meditation has a major impact on fear and anxiety. Anxiety and fear are important patterns. Uh, it also creates uh, a clear evidence of changes to the amygdala. Those are the rock stars. These are those two small cores inside our brain, the amygdala. You can even see this in the MRT. Once you meditate, well, they will no longer beam up. Well, it's important. And this has been proven scientifically. 
this is a means that can support our adaptive uh, reactions, uh, so they can trigger certain desired psychological reactions. As to yoga, we have a high degree of scientific evidence, and scientific evidence means it has been ten tested by independent institutions, also by a com uh, comparative group. Uh, for example, one group practicing yoga, and the other one, this the other group, uh, is used as a double check group uh, without practicing yoga. And uh, yoga helps us. Uh, releasing more uh, neurotransmitters. Uh, if, uh, it, it has an antidepressant effect, in a, to put it very flippantly. Well, I could talk for hours about this uh, telomerase uh, activity. Telomerase is, is an enzyme that uh, triggers a death cell. That's why we can uh, reach a maximum age of 110 or 120 years. Yoga will change the activity of the enzymes. In theory, it can also extend uh, the aging process of cells. So it can extend your lifespan. Another point uh, that I want uh, to mention briefly, epigenetics. Uh, Epigenetics means uh, the study of those processes uh, that are at the interface between our genetic heritage. Well, we know cells have a genetic code, but this is not always activated fully. There are certain sections like a thread. Here is, it is activated, here it is not activated. There are impacts or influences from outside that can trigger or deactivate such uh, activation of genetic information, uh, which brings us to the question, how important is the environment? How important are the people with whom I live? We talked about the energy that can be felt inside this room. This does something to us and also to ourselves. I will skip this. This was briefly about epigenetics. I do not want to elaborate on this, but let me wrap it up, uh, the question. Let's turn it around. What keeps the man healthy? What do we need? Well, we cannot prescribe this on a prescription. Uh, love. Love is a relationship in which we experience that we are appreciated, that we are cherished, that we can talk freely to each other. And we need a task. This is an important point, which is extremely important to me. And I bring this up again and again in my medical appointments. We need, as a man, our task because neurobiologically it's deeply entrenched. We cannot uh, do without it. It is somehow built into our body. We need to find a task where we have this thrill where I say, okay, that's a true challenge. That's the one thing that I want to achieve in my lifetime. And I want to do this because this is in line with my in-new values. And it is something that I can do terribly well. If we experience this, uh, then we release hormones that trigger a status of happiness. And another point that Emery, we can't go it alone. We need a group. Not necessarily do we need a therapist. Uh, uh, well, I'm a therapist myself. Well, uh, there <laughs> might be the odd one who really needs a therapist. We need men around ourselves with whom we can go this way together. Uh, to put it simply, check your mind. Where are you now? What are your behavioral patterns? How are you positioned in your relations? How important is this relation to you? It's a major point. Well. I have two or three minutes uh, left to say a few words about spirituality, which is a very important point for me from a personal point of view, from my personal experience. A quote by Dalai Lama, and this r somehow resonates with me. Tra we uh, leave behind the scientific method. Our mind is not bound materially or spatially to our brain. It could well exist also outside of our body, which is uh, the starting point of spiritual medicine. Spiritual 
healers approach the diseases of men through their world of emotions. If you are sick or have a disease, there is somehow a blocked emotion. There is a communicative pathway in the body which is purely energetic. And there is also a link up uh, to something higher outside, which is outside of your, maybe outside of your body, which links us, however, as we are speaking, the system of energetic structures, you know it from the school medicine, academic medicine, uh, vessels, nerves, bodily organs, and so on. These are similar theoretical concepts. Well, scientists scientific evidence for spiritual healing is very scarce because it is so utterly difficult to capture these emotions, to capture this energy. However, and abusing the head of the Institute for Spirituality and Medicine at the University, Witten Herdecke, I met up with him at a conference where it was about meditation and science, and he presented a study where they checked whether spiritual actions uh, may have a healthy effect or a good effect on your health, and not for the addressee. If we say, okay, let's pray for somebody, let's say. Well, probably the one for who we pray will benefit from it. No, but it does certainly make a difference to us, to the pray praying people. There is scientific evidence that those people who have uh, uh, built a spiritual basis, even uh, either in a group with like-minded people, as you can read here, they have a positive uh, outcome on their health system. They have a stable immune system, and uh, very rarely will they become depressed. If they ever become depressed, they will get out of it soon. Well, it's not about a community of beliefs, but this has also been checked. Uh, for example, any community of beliefs that has uh, punishment, for example, you need to go to uh, the uh, religious service, and if you don't do this, you will be sent to hell. Well, then, if you need to subject to a set of rules to become a member of the spiritual elite, then it does not work, but it's more about a holistic thing. So we believe in some belonging together, then will it work? What about spiritually? How to read? Helmut Schmidt, uh, said, who uh, has visions should rather go to a doctor, Friedrich Nietzsche. He said, whoever has got a why will suffer practically any how I, for men, for us. I think we need to tackle this issue sooner or later. We need our mission. And for a mission, for a task, you need a vision. How you reach a vision or your mission, well, for me. It cannot be just a, a one-off conference. Uh, I joined ranks with a group uh, of Franciscan monks uh, that had been trained by Richard Rohr. And what helped me a great deal was uh, the proximity to, to nature, to, to get into contact. The stadium is similar to what we will be reaching within 15 minutes during ice bathing. It took a longer time for me to realize this. but. Uh, I love spending time. I, th I think, think it's of the essence uh, to enter into contact with our soul, to be able to detect our vision and our mission. To wrap it up briefly, integrative medicine means that we go well beyond the Western purely uh, somatic medicine, mind-body medicine, and spiritual healing process. We have a variety of scientific evidence. I do not want to, to elaborate on this, but as men, we are self-determined as uh, human beings. Uh, it's our mission to take care of ourselves, but we are not a merely biological being, but also a s social being a, and also a spiritual being. Therefore, and that is my vision, my mission, I want to shape medicine in such a way 
especially for men, uh, we are somewhat uh, different structurally speaking from the hormone point of view. We need to enter into contact with the body. We need clear insights into what is going on in our mind from a structural point of view. And somehow we need uh, to get into contact with the soul so that we can embark on our mission. And on that note, I would like to extend my heartfelt thanks and I'm open to take your questions. Well, thanks a lot. Do we have time, John? Well, take your time, five minutes. Okay. Sorry, this comment is off the mic, so the interpreters can't hear it. But it was obviously about the slide with the transgenerational traumas. Yes, exactly, that's a big topic, in particular for our parents and the post-war generation the transgenerational traumas that are passed on from generation to generation. And that's where epigenetics play a role, because when people experience these traumas, these traumas will be inscribed into the person's genetic code. And it has been shown, at least in animal tests, and also by looking at the biographies of humans, obviously this code this traumatic code that's inscripted into the genes can be passed on to future generations. For example, let's say your grandfather has ha been traumatized severely during uh, the war, then after the war his son will inherit the um, inscription, the traumatic inscription uh, in the genes and will then well, pass it on to his sons. So what they did in the animal tests was they had a look at animals that had been traumatized, and then they took that experience, that memory, away from them again. And that's how the um, the gene was, well, disabled again. I mean, it was still passed on to the next generation, but it was closed, so to speak. It was no longer active. Now, that's, this is a very new, a very young research field, but they have tested this with mice. It is possible to do that. What they do is they detect this genetic code, this trauma code, in the sperm of a mouse, and then they change the uh, inscription, they disabled, they disactivated this code, um, and then the next generation of mice didn't have this trauma anymore. Now that is very interesting, and this will definitely play a role in the context of transgenerational traumas that are passed on from generation to generation. Th sorry, I think you were next, and you have the mic, okay. Hi, I'm Fabian, and I have a very personal question. What's your mission? Well, in a way, I just said so. My mission is, okay, 30 seconds. I'm a trained surgeon. And in the field of surgery, I focus on urology. So that's the work that I learned to do with my hands. I um, inserted prostheses into men who had erectile dysfunction. Only a few surgeons do that, and that's why I saw a lot of male patients. And the more male patients I saw, the more I noticed that these men have a huge issue. It's not just about inserting this prosthesis, but it's about so much else. Because because of the situation, because of their erectile dysfunction, these men had a problem with their masculinity vis-a-vis -vis their wives or vis-a-vis -vis their children or the people around them. And that's why I developed further um, in my field. Um, I also got an additional training um, as a psychotherapist, and now I want to offer my patients a holistic treatment. I want these men to have the chance to get healthy again body, with their bodies, but also their souls and their spirit. Where are the mics? Well, in the ideal case, maybe you can raise your hand and then I will bring you a mic. Sorry, again, a comment that is off the mic. The interpreters can't hear what the gentleman is saying. Sorry for that. Anyway, um, the answer is, <laughs> in the
the international classification of diseases, you know, that's a standard registry that we can um, consult. And for two years, uh, amongst the diseases that are listed there, there has been addiction to gaming and addiction to online. So that's quite. N these are quite newly discovered diseases. People who be develop this kind of addiction to gaming or to using the internet. It is similar to well, substance abuse. And if you try to overcome this, then the withdrawal symptoms will be similar as well. So if you have passed uh, a certain limit, if you have exceeded a certain threshold, then you have to well do a withdrawal really. Um, it's like when you stop using drugs. So if you use the internet too much or if you game too much, then um, first and foremost you have to find somebody um, who helps you find out why you developed these habits in the first place. Because there must have been something that caused this in the first place. And there must have been something that, um, well, made you ignore the warning signs. It's like, you know, you smoke, and there's a reason for that. And you go on smoking, even though you know it's unhealthy. You play games, even though you know it's not good for you, because you feel tired and you don't perform at work anymore. You know of all these symptoms, you know about all these problems, and still you go on doing that. So you need a withdrawal. You have to go to a clinic for, a few, for three months, you have to go for a walk in the forest, have good conversations, join other men at a campfire. So that is the um, answer I can give you now. Another option would be, well, groups with other men that meet in short intervals, um, but there you would have to develop a strong um, emotional tie to the other men in the group. And there's an international group um, that's called Manifesto. It's an international group of men that gets together every two weeks online with participants from all around the world. And in this group, Manifesto, we um, make a promise at the beginning of each quarter, every three months, we say what we are going to do and to change a certain behavioral pattern. So it's like a pledge that we make. And then that's something that we check on a daily basis. Every day we check if we really keep our promise. So it's like somebody asking you every day, did you game today? And um, if you say yes, then that guy will knock you on the nose. Um, and if you ask why did you do that, then he will knock you on the nose again. No, I'm exaggerating a bit. But you need this daily reminder and you need this close connection to make sure that you get out of this spiral, neurobiologically, so to speak, and then you have to find a way for yourself through the jungle and develop a new structure for yourself that makes sure you can still feel good. Is Paul here? Manifesto? Now he says, because with that kind of addiction, we waste our beautiful energy that we would need for much more important things. Yes, exactly. That's why this conference is so important. You know, there's a social restructuring pro process out there that is required. And we can't just sit uh, at the computer watching porn and uh, playing computer games during that time.